So let's transition now. I, I know um, this, this thing is a little scary for me. Um, not uh, really. So the, the, it, was, it was kind of like uh, Will, it was kind of, it was a gift given to me. And, and it was like, well, will he actually wear it? I'm like, you don't understand. I have no shame anymore. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, you don't understand the lengths I will go. So yes, my only concern is there's no belt loops. So I got to kind of like just do this thing every now and then. And I don't own suspenders, so that's on the list for next year. Um, and it's really hot. So it is not a high quality suit, so it is really hot. And I don't wear suits. Uh, so anyways, but thank you for the gift. I'm sorry for the distraction. Um, but we're going to go forward. So uh, it is week four of Advent. I mean, it is abso- to me, it's bonkers because it feels like we just celebrated 4th of July or something. I mean, it is it has gone gangbusters. It's gone crazy. It's gone fast. A lot of different things happen in 2019, and, and we're excited to see what 2020 has and all of your creative spins on 2020 vision, and I can see things and all that stuff. So we're, we're excited for that. Um, but, you know, it, Christmas, like we talked about earlier, is, is one of those things that creates a lot of stress, um, it, it, which is kind of the odds does the opposite of what's supposed to be. We're supposed to take a day off of work and school vacation and, and rest in our Savior, and we just become stressed out. And, and, but one of the things that, that we're told oftentimes in stressful situations and angry situations and those things to dif- help diffuse it, to help us focus, we're told, find your happy place. And we're told, find that happy place in your mind and in, in, your, in, your, uh, in your mind's eye. What is the place you can go to to just cool down to relax. Some of you picture yourself on the side of a beach or a mountain. Me, I'm on a golf course, you know, whatever. What is that place? And, and even better for us is when we would actually be in that happy place, right? Uh, especially in the craziness of chaos is I don't want to be here. I want to be there, right? And, and we're, found, we're told to find our happy place, whatever that is. And I'm not even on the right page and I'm sorry. So I got to get to my notes so we really don't get on a tangent. Okay. All right. My favorite band is Switchfoot, and they recently did a song called All I Need, and in the song they say these lines, There is a place down by the ocean where I take my mixed emotions, where my soul's rocked by explosions of these tired times. They're singing about that. There is something within us that connects with different places, different things, about where I can just rest, where I can come and refocus, uh, gather myself, think clearly, pray, whatever it is. Right? We have these places. And so let me, let me ask you the question then. So in these craziness, in these crazy times, in these difficult times, is there a place that you have found that you're able to go and connect with God? Like it really set aside, like I can go to this place and it helps me just kind of hone in, refocus, and connect with God in a new way. This whole idea of a happy place is actually pretty difficult for me sometimes. Like I, I have found solace in, in, in several areas. And, and, and so I've never been able to find like, this is my one place I can go and I know I can come back focused and rested or whatever. Because I, I found the uh, side of the mountain, I, I've looked out and I've seen the grandeur of God and the mountains and the m- just beauty of it all, of the forests. And I, I, I've, I've seen the beauty of the prairie and it, it's there. And, and I've heard somebody refer to it as, um, it's just an ocean made of dirt right? Because you can see forever in a day and the sunsets are beautiful. So I've, I've been able to find solace and peace in my ocean of dirt. I, I've, I've, I've found solace in, in my happy place at the golf course or on a sports field. I've, I've found my happy place in, in just a road trip, maybe. You know, get some windshield time, think, listen to an audio book, a podcast, listen to some music. Sometimes I shut it all off and I just think and pray. I don't close my eyes, but I pray uh, when I'm driving. And, and so for me, it's always been difficult to just say, I got to go to my happy place, right? And so I don't know if I ever have one. And so as I was prepping for Advent and, and reading over this series, I, I started to understand or think maybe I don't just need one place. Maybe, maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's more than just one happy place that I can go to and, and focus in. And I think there's a, there's a, in the story, it tells us a lot of different things that places that we can go uh, to reconnect. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter two. This is going to be our reading for today. Um, there should be a Bible in front of you. You're welcome to take that home with you if you don't have one. Bible app, 
your own Bible, um, all that. And, and just save that spot. We're going to come back to it and refer to it here in, in just a second. But in the Old Testament, um, what people would do oftentimes when they have a connection with God, they'd meet God at a certain place. Moses did this, Abraham did this, Isaac, Jacob, all these people did it. They'd meet with God, they'd have an experience with God at a certain location, and they would physically, geographically place a marker. It'd be called an altar. The Bible says they would build an altar to the Lord. And that altar would always refocus them. It'd bring them back to that memory and that experience with God. Here's some examples. Genesis 8.20, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Genesis 12.7, and Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. Genesis 13.18, then Abram built another altar to the Lord. Genesis 26, 25, then Isaac built an altar there and worshiped him. See, the altars, they're, they're just wonderful reminders. They're just that, that physical checkpoint that says, when, I, when I've gone away and I can come back, I can see that thing, I can see that marker, and that can remind me of the encounter I had with God. Many of us have those things. We, we carry mementos. We carry childhood treasures. We, we make notes uh, in a journal or something or uh, anything. We always have those things that bring us back. And, and so these altars would, would be placed as a memory. Now, the unique thing about the altars, though, is, is God says, you have to build that altar, but you're not staying here. And that's why the altar would be built. Because the people recognizing God from God says, you can't stay in this place. I have more for you. I, I have things for you to do. You need to go out. You need to serve and accomplish the mission that I've called you to do. So they built this altar as a remembrance, as a checkpoint, but they couldn't stay there. They couldn't stay and just dwell in that place. God says, I have so much more for you. This happened in the New Testament too. There's an experience on the mountain. The apostles are with Jesus on the mountain. And, and some of us know that as the transfiguration. But look what it says in the story in Matthew chapter 17. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the man watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter explained, exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son, whom brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. <laughs> right. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So they have this experience, and they want to build this memorial, this altar. They want to stay in the presence of God on this mountain. They just want to take it all in for their entire lives. And, and in one uh, other telling of the story, it says, They said this because the apostles didn't know what they were saying. They didn't fully understand what it meant to, to stay in that presence versus the mission Jesus had. And G, it says later in the story, in, in verse 9, it says, we need to go down the mountain. They weren't supposed to stay there. So that happy place that they wanted to create, that place on the mountain that they wanted to stay in the presence of God, Jesus says, this is great, I get it, but we have something else to accomplish. There is something more to do. Now, hear me what I'm saying, that having that happy place, that, that spot by the ocean, the place in the mountains, the, the ocean of dirt, the golf course, whatever it is, is not bad. Praise God, hallelujah, because I like my golf course, right? It's not bad. It's good to have. It's good to have that place that we can get refreshed and we can get renewed and we can be encouraged. It's not bad. That's not what we're saying. But the question for us is, are we limiting where God exists to that one spot? Do we say that I can only connect with God in my happy place? That I can only connect with God if I'm, it's utterly quiet and I have candles lit and I'm in a corner in a room with my journal. That's the only time I can connect with God. What is it that, that we can do? All right, so now let's jump into our text today to, to understand a little bit more about this. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 8. It says this, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, 
Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and in peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angel returned to heaven and the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem, let's see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. And it was just as the angel had told them. So Luke's account of Jesus' birth shows us that the love of God, Emmanuel, is Christ with us. Essentially, that the love of Jesus, Christ, is here. Now, this tor- story tells us a few places about, and we're going to ask ourselves where the love of Jesus Christ is found. Is it just our happy place? Where is the love of Christ found? Is it just in our happy place? But I think the story tells us four, four spaces anyways, at least that I found. Uh, the first place is that love is found in our workplaces. Love is found in our workplaces or in the fields. Uh, New Testament scholar Joel Green says that the amazing news of the birth of the Savior is not in the temple, but it's on the farm. It's not in the palace, but it's in the field, right? That's where it was. See, shepherds were not the social outcasts that people make them out to be. They weren't these, these people ostracized and, and shunned out there. But they, at the same time, they weren't exactly highfalutin, right? They, they weren't well off, Um, So they were kind of somewhere in between. But the the truth is, for someone to have wealth, a lot of times it was identified as how many cattle you had, how many sheep you had. So it had, all of that stuff had to be managed. All that stuff had to be cared for, right? So they had a very important role. They had a very important job, but it didn't make them high members of society, right? But they had a very kind of mundane thing that they would do. I mean, they would be responsible. All those sheep would go out to the field, one, two, three, counting sheep. Hopefully they didn't fall asleep, one, two, three. And as they came back in, they'd count them, one, two, three. Uh, they'd shear the sheep. Uh, there's stories in, the, in those days that they'd milk the sheep for food and dairy. And it's kind of just a mundane thing. It wasn't exciting. It, and, and it was in the midst of that mundane, that boring, that non-eventful thing that the angels showed up. It was at their workplace that the angels showed up and made this huge proclamation that, hey, the Messiah is coming, and, and, and you are going to have a, 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 a role in that. See, without it, hold on. Sorry about that. They didn't really see sometimes the value of what they did. They're just kind of out in the field with the sheep and doing somebody else's job, and, and they had a hard time sometimes seeing, I would imagine, the, like, there's got to be more than this, right? There's just got to be more than just taking care of these sheep out in the field and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting out here and it, it's whatever. And, and I wonder if sometimes we feel that about our jobs, about the places that we go, that there's got to be more, right? And it just doesn't give us life. It doesn't fill us up. And, and, and we, get dr- we just dread the mundane. We dread the ordinary. And we want something. We want our lives to matter, Right? And so we get so focused on wanting it to matter that we don't focus on the mundane. And I heard it said this once, the number of people who are unemployed isn't as great as the number of people who are not working. See, the desire to have something beautiful out of the ordinary is strong. We all want something in our lives to matter. We want our ordinary, we want our jobs to really matter. And, and, and if you allow me, I'm going to take a little rabbit trail here because oftentimes I think many times we do this with, with, with what we do in the church too. And, and we, we show up and we show up to an event or we, we, we greet people at the door. We visit somebody in their home. We shovel snow. We help with kids, whatever. And, and we think like, well, I'm only doing this and I'm not really doing much for, for God or I'm not doing much for the church. Let me tell you, that's the exact opposite. As a volunteer leader, no matter what area you do, you are a vital part of somebody's worship experience. Just like the angels came and spoke to the shepherds, they helped the shepherds see God. 
As, as, as somebody who serves and a volunteer leader in this church, you all serve and help point people to God, no matter what you do. But there is something within us, no matter what it is, whether it's our work, whether it's our church, uh, our families, we long for something of value. We want something uh, big. We want something meaningful and important. And I can imagine the shepherds had the same thing. Look what, look what it says in, in verse 20. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. See, when they went and experienced the Messiah, it was just as they saw it. It was just as they were told. It was just as they experienced. And, and they had this encounter. And, but here's the deal. They didn't just throw everything away. They had this amazing encounter with God. And, and they didn't just say, well, I'm done with that. I want, this is what I want now. I want to just have this big experience for my entire life. And I want to stay here. It says they went back. They have now had an encounter with the Holy God and they went back to their mundane, to their boring day at school, to their boring day at their job, whatever they think it is. But now it's not just mundane. Now it's been impacted by an encounter with God and the shepherds have taken that back to their workplace. The shepherds have taken that back. And so right now, where is your workspace? Do you expect God to show up? Do you expect that Jesus Christ is at your workspace? Do you expect a life to be changed or an encounter at God? And how might it be different knowing that you can affirm that you have had an encounter with Jesus? How might it be different in your workplace if you can affirm that and take that to your workplace, take that to your school, take that to the places you go? Because Christ is, Love is here, and it's in your workplace. The next place love is found. Love is found in the home. Love is found in the home. Now, it's, it's kind of become commonplace that Mary and Joseph were, <laughs> were kicked out by angry innkeepers, right? They show up, and there's this, this curmudgeon of an innkeeper, people all crowding up in his business, and sees a pregnant lady and, and her husband, fiance, and says, yeah, I don't want you. Get out of here. And we have this weird idea that this guy or gal, this innkeeper, is just angry. But it's really probably not like that. So back in the day, the houses were kind of two stories. The, the animals would live on the bottom and the people would live on the top. And, and since this was a time of taking a census, everybody coming back home, this house was probably a family member. And so they come to Bethlehem to see a family, say, I can stay with Aunt Sally May or whatever. Right? That's a very biblical name. Um, the Aunt Sally May. And they get there and that house is just jammed, packed. Like they are sleeping on top of each other, shoulder to shoulder. It's miserable. And so they get there. It's like, we literally have nothing. We have no room to put you anywhere. So you get the lower accommodations. So they go down and they stay down there. So it wasn't like this, this angry innkeeper. It wasn't like a family member who didn't like them. It, it was just really, it was crowded. It was overcrowded and there was no room. And so they literally just had to take the opposite uh, accommodations, right? Now look at verse 12. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Now, can we acknowledge this is not a conventional birth? I mean, it, the whole thing wasn't conventional. It wasn't conventional how they discovered Jesus is coming. It wasn't conventional about going to the inn that's overcrowded. It wasn't conventional about staying with the animals. And it's definitely not going to be conventional about giving birth in this scenario, right? But uh, let me ask you, you ever, you ever thought about what your dream home looks like? You ever thought about that? Like, what is my dream home? If I could have any home, any house, what is my dream home? Maybe you live in one. But every year, um, HGTV, um, the bane of every husband's existence, HGTV does a show uh, called The Dream Home. And they build this house made of perfect materials and beautiful setting, beautiful everything. And it's a dream home. You can register to win these homes, these, these huge homes and beautiful. And, and it's not for everybody. But the idea is that it's this beautiful dream home that somebody can move into and it's perfect, right? And, and, and maybe you've had those ideas like I want my dream home to have like 10 garage stalls or a kitchen the size of a house, whatever it is. I don't know. But we all have kind of this idea of a dream home and it's enticing. And it's enticing to have this picture of even our families as perfection, 
right? In, in social media, we only see snapshots and we see all the funny, quirky, wonderful things our kids do. We don't see them puking up on us. We don't see the long nights. We don't see uh, the arguments that we have with our spouse or our loved ones. We don't see the, the, the hard things at work. And it's this picture of perfection. And, and we say, that's what I want. We get Christmas cards in the mail now, right? And when we send out Christmas cards, you know, mom asks you, nope, we have to take another one. Somebody wasn't smiling. Somebody wasn't opening their eyes. Somebody wasn't doing this. And we try to create this perfect picture, right? And we get these pictures from people. It's like, oh, I wish I had that, right? And we, we, this whole idea of perfection does not exist. Whatever we are trying to create in a home, in our families, in, in anything, it, there is no such thing as perfect, the, the, the set, setting and scenario that Jesus came into and Mary and Joseph came into was unconventional. God can meet and will meet our families, our lives in the unconventional. Jesus showed up in the unconventional. And regarding that story, it, that's not our first choice, is it? No, I can't, if I asked everybody in here, would you like to give birth in a, in a sterile hospital or would you like to go into the go sleep with the animals? Nobody would say the animals, right? It's unconventional. It's not good. We don't like it, right? It's not even our hundredth choice. But that was the birthplace of a king. That was the unconventional birthplace that God chose. So in the midst of our perfection's pursuit, our, our desire for the perfect family, the perfect life, the perfect home, it doesn't exist. So what if we understood that the same God showed up in the birthplace of a Jesus in an unconventional way can show up in your unconventional home with its debt, with its frustration, with its overbaked cookies, with nobody smiling, whatever it is. What if we understood that, that Christ is here, love has come to your unconventional home and be okay with that? How would it change how you interact? How would it change with how you looked at perfection within your family, within your home, understanding that Jesus can show up? All right, another place love is found. Love is found in the world. Boy, that's a hard one, isn't it? Boy, it's hard to see sometimes how love is found in this world. The world is, seems to be angry, running around, crazy. And it's just hard to get our minds wrapped around the fact that there is love in this world. And, and now there's a cute saying that I, I, I've seen either on social media or somewhere. It says, um, if you can't find the love in the world, be the love. That's really cute. That's really great. Looks great on a coffee mug or a reclaimed wood board picture on your wall. I don't know, whatever you want, a HGTV thing with it. It, it looks great. But, but let me ask you, what if we stopped looking for everybody else to be that love? What if we didn't start with trying to find it in other people? What if we just decided that since our lives are connected with that unconventional Christ King that came, that we would just demonstrate love to the world? We would be that example. Look what it says in verses 13 and 14. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those on whom God is pleased. The shepherds left. They saw the baby king. They saw Jesus. They exactly how the angels said. And they left. And it, it seems they, they told everybody, anybody who would listen, even if you didn't want to listen, they were telling them, look what we found. And it was absolutely incredible. It was amazing. It was such a great thing. But they proclaimed peace. They didn't just proclaim peace in a single home. They didn't just proclaim peace in your heart. They didn't just proclaim peace in a happy place. They proclaimed peace to the world. That the God who came in the form of Jesus says his, it's in his reign, his eternal reign, that peace will never end. Look what it says in Luke. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. In the kingdom of God with Jesus, there will be peace. It will never end. How comforting is that? To know that there will be peace. Look Now, look down at verse 17, uh, the shepherds pointed to. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angels said to them about this child. 
it was amazing. The shepherds had this encounter with God and they tell everybody of the amazing experience they had. And it wasn't Caesar who was going to bring the peace. In the monk, monks' census, it wasn't Caesar. Let me put this in, in our context. It's not an elephant or a donkey that will bring peace. It is not a world government. It's not a politician. It, it is not. It is Jesus will bring peace. Jesus is the hope of the world. It's not a cute saying on a coffee mug. Jesus is our hope. The fields took on new meaning for the shepherds. Their work took on new meaning. Their engagement and and conversations with each other took on new meaning. The angel's words explain the truth of his presence. And I love how, how Paul captures the idea of all of creation, all of humanity, all people are just longing and waiting for this peace. Look what it says in Romans 8. That's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good times. The created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God reigns it in until both creation and all creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. See, the message of peace is a heavenly one. And for some, it's, it's not for some spaces, but not for others. It's not for some people, but not for others. It's for all people, all places, all things at all times. That is the message of peace for the kingdom of heaven. Cyberspace, outer space, inner space, doesn't matter. That is a message. So I would ask you then, what would it be like for you to encounter the spaces you go into after you've had an encounter with Jesus? To encounter your classroom, to encounter your social media interaction, to encounter politics, to encounter your family, extended family at Christmas. What would it look like for the spaces that you involve yourself in, the spaces you go to affirm that anywhere you go, that love is here. Another place that love is found is love is found in the heart. Love is found in our heart. For those of you that have experienced the craziness of a new baby, you understand that it's not exactly always great. It's not always exactly peaceful. Um, There's all sorts of things. You've got visitors, you've got family, you've got poop, you've got all sorts of stuff, right? Right? Everything happening. And Mary and Joseph are in the midst of that. They're going crazy. They, they're surrounded in Bethlehem in this house by family and family and family. Then they get visitors. They have no clue who they are. They were just told, hey, God sent us here. Great, come on in, right? They're surrounded by all of this stuff. They're trying to figure out how to be new parents. They're trying to figure out how to be a couple as, as teenagers. They've got all of these experiences And all of this excitement and the shepherds are coming in. Hey, this is awesome. This is great, right? And now the families in Bethlehem are are, are surrounding them and it's just crazy. It's just chaos. And they're trying to figure out how to do it. But in the midst of all of this activity, in the midst of all the newness of, of a newborn baby, Mary is able to reflect and slow down. Mary is able to gather some things into her heart and to her mind about what is going on. She becomes reflective of all things. Look what it says in verse 19. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. So she takes all of these events, all of these encounters, all of these things and starts mulling them in her heart and her mind. She starts putting them together and reflecting on them and the story of God unpacking about what is happening and slowly her mind and her heart starts to become more focused on God. It slowly starts to become more and more like God because of all these stories, all these events, all of these things that are happening. And she grows closer and closer to God. There's this not necessarily outward exuberance like the shepherd show. It wasn't this big party, but she's reflective. She's gathering it all in, and her heart and mind are starting to change to be more like God. Jesus expressed it this way in Matthew 5. You have heard that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who you love, what reward is that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. 
This whole idea of our hearts and mind becoming more like God's, we call that holiness. We, the holiness of, of our reshaping, the, the re, as Romans call it, the renewing of our minds, renewing of our hearts. It's holiness. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and angels, but don't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had a faith that could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would gain nothing. And John says it this way, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commands us. Those who obey God's commands remain in fellowship with him and he with them. And we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. All of these passages, these short ideas point to holiness, point to us becoming more and more like God in everything we do, taking in the experiences, the understanding, and the knowledge of God. They could be exuberant, exciting experiences. They could be reflective experiences. The point is that God doesn't want us to stay there. God doesn't want us just to stay and and say, I wish, uh, I want this to never end. Because Jesus is calling the apostles and us to come down off the mountain. God is calling us to move away from the altar of whatever that experience was and to take it. To take a life that has been changed to becoming more and more like God, to become more and more holy, and to change our workplace. To change our home. To change the spaces that we go to. What would it look like to take that embodiment of love that is here now, that has come, and take that out, to actually demonstrate that, to show that the hope of this world is found in Jesus Christ. What does it look like in your classroom? What does it look like at at your work? What does it look like in your engagements online? What does it look like? How might your heart be different with an encounter with God? How might your mind be renewed or changed with an encounter with God? With God. So this Christmas, I, I hope that we can let the love of Christ be here. Not, not just at Living Hope, but here, where you are, wherever you are, with that, whoever you're talking to, with, with whatever you're doing, that the love of Christ is here. And everywhere you go, you would carry that with you and you would, you would know that in your heart. It says, I am here. I have been changed by Jesus. The love of Jesus is here now. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for who you are. Man, it's humbling to think and know that you came in the form of this little itty-bitty baby. You came in a very unconventional way, in an unconventional place, at an unconventional time. Here's Mary and Joseph figuring all of this out in a very difficult and unconventional way. And, and, and there's these shepherds who've been in the field, which you don't know the last time they actually cleaned themselves. And they, but they're just full of excitement because they were given a message. And, and, and God, whatever message that we've received from you at, at any time, to, to say, hey, your love is here. It's in your life. God, help me to take that just like the shepherds did and go and encounter, go back to work and encounter uh, my workplace with a changed life for you. That I'd be like, uh, like Mary and Joseph and that, that love is here in my home. And, and, and God, that it would renew us. It would change us to the th- th- to think that I don't just have to go to a church on a Sunday morning and that's the only place. I don't have to go to my happy place and that's the only place I can experience. But God, you have called me to go, not to just stay in one spot, not just to stay and experience one thing, but to go. Come down off the mountain, go away from the altar and to bring you into all the spaces that I go. Online, 
physical world, wherever it is. So Jesus, this Christmas, help us to take that. Help us to take that to heart, to know that you want us to take that to our extended family and to all the things and to slow down. That idea of perfection won't exist. So Father, thank you for entering into all of that, to demonstrating the perfect love is available and you are the hope of the world. Father, we give you this day, we give you our, our service, our give, our give you our lives, and no matter what it is, joys, hurts, burdens, we're thankful that you're here. We're thankful that you can take it all, that there's nothing um, too big or too small that you don't already love and care for. So Father, we give you this day, we love you. 